Today, we're happy to present the Immune Bio Network. We would like to remind you to join the HC if you are not a member yet. You can join any of the 18 biological networks. Uh, you can uh, become a member of as many as you would like to join. Um, and also would like to remind you to uh, submit your upcoming publications to be included um, in the uh, HCA publication list. This could help increase the visibility of your papers. So today we're happy to uh, announce uh, several upcoming events. Uh, please register for the HCA um, network seminar uh, that features Kidney by Network that's coming up on June 9th. Uh, the registration is now open for the HCA general meeting. It, it's hybrid. Uh, it's in Vienna, Austria, in the end of June. And uh, you can also join and watch us live um, through streaming. Uh, there's HCA Asia meeting coming up in November and HCA developmental and pediatrics meeting. Uh, both of these are hybrid. Today, uh, we are happy to feature three speakers. Um, so please um, ask, uh, ask your questions in the, uh, in the questions and answers window, and we will have five minutes after each presentation to answer your questions. Uh, we will start with Ramon Soni, um, then Daniel Rain Rainbow, and then Ron Germain, and then we will follow up with a panel discussion led by the Immune Bio Network coordinators, Chloe Villani and Nir Cahoon. And I'm happy to uh, introduce Chloe and Nir and uh, welcome them to the seminar. And uh, Chloe and Nir, um, welcome. And uh, Chloe will introduce our next. Yes, welcome all to um, uh, our webinar today. It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Ramon Massoni Badoza, who holds a Bachelor in Human Biology and a Master in Biomedical Research, as well as a Master in Bioinformatics, all three from the Universitat Pompeu Fabra. Since 2018, he's been pursuing a PhD in single cell genomics in the laboratory of Professor Holden Hines, one of the key pioneering labs of single cells in Spain. Ramon's research focuses on leveraging the intrinsic discriminatory power of single cell technologies to reclassify immune cells and understand how intratumoral heterogeneity evolves during the course of chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Thank you, Ramon, for joining us today. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Chloe. So I will share my screen. OK, so I'm starting. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you all for joining. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. As I said, I'm Ramon Massoni from the Single Cell Genomics team. And here I will present you this talk titled The Periodic Table of Tonsillar Cells, which, as the name suggests, has a very clearly defined objective, which is to create a single cell-driven taxonomy of cell types and states in a human tonsil in the context of the human cell atlas. Now, why do we care about tonsils? Well, First of all, they are located strategically at the intersection between the respiratory and digestive tracts, where they are constantly bombarded by antigens being the first line of defense against many pathogens. Moreover, they are easily accessible through routine tonsillectomies, which makes them an overall great model secondary lymphoid organ. As such, they are the meeting point between antigen-presenting and antigen-recognizing cells, such as T cells and B cells. And when these naive B cells encounter an antigen, they undergo affinity maturation through the germinal center reaction until they differentiate into either memory B cells or antibody producing plasma cells, all with the help of follicular dendritic cells and T follicular helper cells inside B cell follicles. So, as you can see, having a complete map of these cells is key to understand how adaptive immunity develops. And since this is a very mutagenic and proliferative environment, it can help us to map the cell of origin of many germinal center derived lymphomas. And in that pursuit, we are very lucky because we are standing on the shoulders of giants. Because Hamish King and colleagues published last year two seminal articles in Science Immunology, in which they tracked, if at unprecedented resolution, all the gene expression and chromatin accessibility dynamics along this germinal center reaction that I, I was talking about. And what we sought after in, in this project was to expand on their findings and complementing 
not just focusing on B cells, but on every cell lineage in, in the tonsil, including T cells, follicular dendritic cells, myeloid cells, among others. And that's why we pursued this multimodal approach in which each column here is a donor. As you can see, we have a total of 10 donors, which encompass three age groups, kids, young adults, and old adults, cover both sexes, female and male, and we perform a total of five different modalities. Single cell RNA-seq, single cell ataxic, multion, site-seq, and spatial transcriptomics to map the position of the cells in the tissue. Now, I will not go into detail on how we integrated all these modalities, because that's something that we went through last time I presented this work. Here I want to focus on the immunology. And this is a snapshot of the, the summary of our atlas. We have a total of 357,000 cells with a total of 137 clusters across these different modalities. And here I would like to bring your attention to these two small clusters here, which initially clustered together. And once we opened them up, it became very clearly that the main population was plasmacytoid dendritic cells. However, we found also a cluster of 70 cells that express markers of B cells and a cluster of 13 cells that express markers of T cells. And we annotated them as precursor B and T cells because they have an upregulation of the VDJ recombinase genes. So you can see RAG1, RAG2, uh, TDT, as well as genes from the CD1 family. So here we are finding evidence of extrathemic T cell development in human tonsils, something that has been published before, but highlights this unprecedented discriminatory power because we're finding 13 cells out of 300,000 cells. So that's an approach that, that we applied to the, each of the major lineages. And here I will, I will go on to two of the main that we found. First of all, starting with the CD4 T cells, we found a total of 14 clusters. And to explain you these clusters, it all starts with a, when a naive CD4 T cells in the T cell zone of the tonsils interacts and recognizes an antigen presented by dendritic cells. And here we found one cluster of naive T cells that was characterized by the RNA expression, of course, of LEV1, CCR7, and NOSI, and the protein expression of CD45, RA, and selecting L. Moreover, we found two clusters of central memory T cells characterized by the overexpression of IL7R, CD127. And following this initial recognition, CD4 T cells have to choose one of two mm, lineage decisions. They either become non-T follicular helper cells, something that is regulated by BLIMP1, PRDM1, or they become T follicular helper cells, which, in which they will migrate to the center of the follicles and aid in the germinal center reaction. This is guided by the master regulated BCL6 and is characterized by the overexpression of ECOS, IL6 receptor, and CXCR5. In this slide, we found that one of these central memory T cells have regulated these three markers. That's why we annotated it as central memory precursor T follicular helper cell. From here, as, as we said, uh, they either go into non follicular or T follicular helper cells. But as you know, transcription factors suffer particularly from dropout events. That's why Sergio Aguilar, uh, an incredibly talented PhD student in our lab, uh, modeled the gene regulatory networks to infer the activity of these two genes. And as you can see, Sergio was capable of finding this reciprocity, this mutual exclusivity of these two transcription factors. And we were able to find six clusters of T follicular helper cells. Following this, we interrogated our single cell ataxic dataset to see and to check the accessibility of BCL6 at the promoter and gene body of this gene. However, as you can see, we find it to be invariably accessible across all the 14 clusters that we identified. However, Pauli Solea, a postdoc in the lab, was able to predict these regulatory interactions, so, so regions that were correlated with, with this BCL6 gene, and she found a, a strong connection with this super enhancer. This super enhancer was reported in, to, be, uh, to regulate the expression of BCL6 in germinal center B cells. And as you can see here, it's clearly more accessible in these T follicular helper clusters that I showed you before. 
if we collapse the, the peaks that fall in, in this region in upper South score, you can see at the bottom how clearly they are able to distinguish and mark for T follicular helper cells, meaning that ATAXIC is identifying a T follicular helper specific enhancer that potentially controls BCL6 expression. From here, we also annotated the T helper subsets. We would like you to bring the, your attention to the TH22, which overexpress IL22 and IL10. And we also discover three subsets of T regulatory cells. One of them uh, was characterized by the upregulation of IL1 receptor, IL10, CD2, LAC3, and MAF, and also an increased motive activity of genes transcription factors from the MAF family, MAF-F, MAF-G, and MAF. We can also see how these three subsets use, had a different usage of the genes from the IKZF family, so Icaros, Elios, Iolos. The second subset have regulated genes from the TNF RSF family. And finally, we found a subset of T regulatory cells that had a clear naive phenotype, characterized by the upregulation of BLE1 and TCF7 at the RNA level and an increased motive activity of these two same transcription factors at the attack level. Now we are changing gears and focusing on 19 myeloid cell types that we found in human tonsils starting with the five sets of dendritic cells that, that Chloe reported back in 2017 in blood. Then the, we also found three sets of activated dendritic cells that were reported in the thymus atlas. These are CCR7 positive cells. One of them, for example, upregulates IRA, which is the autoimmune regulator. And, and we suspect that this educates these T regulatory cells to induce peripheral tolerance. However, what you can see is that the most predominant subset of clusters were these ones here. And I've been advised not to do this because it's, it's a bit risky, but we are coining these cells slant sites. And let me break it down for you why this is the case. It all starts with this paper published in 2020 that is titled Deciphering the Fate of Slant Positive Monocytes in Human Tonsils by Gene Expression Profiling. So the title suggests the, the authors profiled by bulk transcriptomics SLAN positive cells in, in tonsils. SLAN is a sugar that is frequently found in, in a subset of myeloid cells. But as you can see, SLAN positive monocytes were clearly separated from these tonsil SLAN positive cells, which we can see here in this dendrogram how these mm, so called SLAN sites kind of are kind of its own separate entity. Now, we use the, the genes that were reported in this publication to see if we could find SLAN sites in our 19 clusters. As you can see, these four main clusters had an, an upregulation clearly expressed these SLAN site markers and did not express dendritic cell or macrophage markers. Moreover, these same authors showed how SLAN sites upregulate genes from the C1Q complex, also matrix metalloproteinases such as MMP9 and fucosidases such as FUCA1. So, of course, this begs the question, are all these genes, all these gene families is expressed in a single homogeneous population or do they define different subsets? Of course, the answer is the latter. And we found four subsets of SLAN sites. One that clearly expressed the metalloproteinases, toll-like receptors, the other that expressed the, the C1Q complex and had antigen-presenting capabilities, a third one that expressed the fucosidases, apolipoproteins, and selenopy. And finally, one that expressed IL-6R, IL-4 receptor, IL-18, JAK3, STAT2, among others. Of course, we can collapse all these genes into functions to increase the, the explanatory power using gene set enrichment analysis. And we found that two of these SLAN sites were more metabolically active because they uh, had uh, an upregulation of oxidative phosphorylation. Another two uh, were able to have antigen presenting and extracellular matrix disassembly capabilities. Then, as we said, one of them had this complement activation expressed. And finally, there was one of them, the IL7R MMP12, that produced inflammatory cytokines of the tumor necrosis family. Moreover, since these markers are very specific to these subpopulations, 
we can use them as surrogate to infer their position in the tissue. And we found that they are apparently located at different points and different locations, with MMP being more super epithelial, C1Q8 being super epithelial and in the interfollicular regions, and the CLNOP being in the interfollicular T cell zones. Finally, they showed a clear, a distinct pattern of cell to cell communication. For example, we found that SLAN CLNOP and SLAN IL7R MMP12 potentially interact through CCR1 and CCL18. So, as you can see, this is a, a very rich resource that we want to make as fair as possible for the immune cell atlas community. First stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And here uh, we partner up with Federico Marini, who is my bioconductor mentor, and he helped me to put together these two packages that I will show. Now, according to my PowerPoint, I'm two minutes left to finish this presentation, so I want to do this live. First of all, you would load HCA tonsil data, which is the data package that we developed. So you can see you, you can list all the cell types that you can download in a programmatic and modular manner. Now, for the sake of simplicity, I will download the myeloid cells, which I just presented. You just select which assay you want and which cell type you want from these ones. This will read the data that it's already downloaded from Experiment Hub. As you can see, this is a good old single cell experiment object, which you can browse. It has all the metadata, so, so you can identify the cells. And we can, with three lines of code, we can hopefully map and project the same view map that I just showed you in the publication. Now, a data set is as good as its documentation. So we also found, developed a, a vignette that documents how all this data set was generated and how you can use HCA tonsil data to access the data, which we think that will be handy for the upcoming Jamboree and Immune Cell Atlas. Now, coming back to the presentation, we also develop locator to make our data set reusable and to project cells. Well, basically, this locator stands for is an R package that locates cells from secondary lymphoid organs. And we apply this to the mantle, to the tumor microenvironment of two mantle cell lymphoma patients. And for the CD4 T cells, we obtain these results, which hopefully you can see a clear enrichment in T regulatory cells, something that was published last year and contributes to create an immunosuppressive environment so that the tumor can progress. So with that, I, I conclude. I would like to, today I was the spokesperson, but this the hallmark of this project is that it's a highly collaborative project, which is, was designed by the masterminds of Holger, Iñaki, Elias, and Ivo. The data was produced by our incredible experimental team. Uh, our immunologists annotated all these cells, led by Juan Nieto. And finally, the computational team involves Pauli, Sergio Marx, Sonal, Clara Will, and Fede, to whom we are very grateful. Finally, I would like to conclude that we have created the most comprehensive compendium of cell types and states of a human secondary lymphoid organ to date, that a single cell atlas is more than a UMAP with labels. It's a platform for in silico hypothesis generation, and that our atlas is a fair resource. It's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. With that, I thank you all for your attention and I will take questions. Thank you. Thanks, Ramon. That was fantastic and really beautifully done. Um, I you. had a, a question for you um, about the SLAN cells, SLAN positive cells. So even though in the, when you showed, yeah, when you showed this exactly, that's the plot. Um, in the second one, when you have the, the trees, yeah. So the way it's um, shown here, the, they're very specialized to the to the tonsils. And um, what I'm curious about is, even though there are SLAM uh, positive monos in the blood, and they're far away in the tree, can you somehow create an equivalence between them? In other words, they're clearly going closer. Blood is going closer to other blood cells, and tonsil going closer to other tonsil cells, which is interesting. Although you worry about you know, batch effects when you, when you see that. So the question is, have you used other methods to look for equivalence um, uh, between these that's kind of batch independent 
Uh, so using using other methods, uh, for example, harmony to bring these data sets together and see if they if they find each other or whether they're really distinct spam positive cells. So that's kind of an important question just for kind of the mapping between uh, tissues, whether it's toxin or blood or maybe even uh, other tissues. So thank you for your question. We indeed use harmony to correct for batch effects in our own data. However, we didn't integrate our atlas across tissues. And what you're asking is a, a really relevant question. And I wonder, once we start integrating slam positive cells from other sources, such as blood, how close these, these two will be once we correct for batch effects. This is something that hopefully we will do in the upcoming Jamboree or Immune Cell Atlas, and we will figure out. Great, yeah, I think that's, that's perfect, an important question. So Ra, um, there's a question from Ron Germain uh, asking how you generated, go to the spatial slide of uh, the localization of the cells, um, what were the methods you used to uh, generate that and how did you identify their, uh, the subtypes of the location? So we used two, two methods in this publication. This is analyzed by Marke Losua. Uh, one is spotlight, which is uh, the convolution method. And this we use when the markers that identify a particular cell type are not clearly distinct and, for example, can be shared by another population. For example, we see a, a very specific expression of BCL6 in, in follicles. However, we don't know if the source are germinal center B cells or T follicular helper cells. And in this setting is where we use the convolution methods, such as uh, spotlight. But in this case, since these markers were so specific to this subpopulation across all the cell types that we defined in, in our tonsil atlas, we use them as surrogate of their spatial location. And, and this, the is, this is Visium, right? It's Visium, yeah, it's 10x yeah. Visium. And mm -hmm. this was normalized, and then the data was also imputed with MISIC. To, I see, to I see one Q, obviously, it's also on the macrophages and you know, other cell types, right? But it's just, you're just referring to the top marker, but you're using signature to do this, right? Yeah. And what's your interpretation of the, local, of the localization in terms of potential functionality um. yeah that's that's a, a tricky one because these ones that we see more super epithelial and also for example have a, a higher mhc2 so antigen presenting capacity yeah. we don't know if they would be as soon as the the antigen is uptaken by by m cells and enters the tissue Perhaps these AIDS dendritic cells or other antigen presenting cells in presenting it to to naive T cells that then will will migrate to the T follicular T interfollicular zone. Uh, but yeah, it's it's to be determined. Of course, this is what we find in an unsupervised manner. And now we need a lot of experimental validation to to disentangle that. Mm -hmm. Um, another question is, were, this, uh, were the SLAN sites specific to some donors and not others? Was it a general finding? No, it was a, a general finding. Yeah. We were shared across them. And do you think that there are equivalent cells of either DCs or monocytes that are similar to these? Is there is an equivalence there? Even though you didn't mention that I think explicitly. I was curious about that. So, again, this will, we will find out more as soon as we start integrating more because of mm -hmm. course we use the tonsil as a secondary lymphoid organ but i'm curious to see once we start integrating lymph nodes spleen pair patches if this is something that we find across all secondary lymphoid organs or is it something that it's specific to tonsil and mm -hmm. for what the data shows us these are these clearly have this high expression whereas we have other macrophages that have this signature. We have monocytes that also share a lot of genes with, with these ones. And we have the different sets of dendritic cells. So that's all that we can tell from this data set. But of course, uh, I'm eager to see what happens once we are integrating more, more cells. 
Great, perfect. Now, this is a, these are really exciting findings. Thanks so much. I'm delighted today to introduce Danielle Rainbow. Uh, Danielle worked as a computer, computational associate in the Diabetes and Inflammatory Laboratory headed by Professor John Todd and Linda Wicker for more than 15 years before completing his PhD um, uh, from Oxford University in Genetics of Autoimmune Disease. He's currently working in the laboratory of Dr. Joe Jones in the Department of Clinical Neuroscience at the University of Cambridge, where he's investigating tissue resident immunity immune cells, primary through the lens of single cell genomics. Uh, welcome, Daniel. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you for the introduction. Okay, so yeah, as I was introduced, my name is Daniel Rainbow. I'm a postdoc in Joe Jones' lab at the University of Cambridge, and today I'll present our work on developing an integrated map of the immune system in humans across tissues and ages. This is a uh, CCI-funded single cell project, and the idea is to um, develop a map of the human immune system across tissues and the human lifespan. The rationale behind this project is only 5% of the immune cells found within blood, the majority are located within tissues. However, the majority of human studies are in blood as it's so easy to access. And so the aim is to build a reference tissue atlas to expand, extend our basic under, understanding of the immune system with the aim of collecting multiple tissues from the same donor and this will have translational implications of, as it will be a data set that can be queried against disease, cancer, or autoimmune disease, autoimmune disease data sets to see what is altered. And by including the human, age, human lifespan, age can be taken into account in any analysis. This is a collaboration between five different groups, four involved in tissue collection and processing. These include Donna Farber and Peter Sims at Columbia University, Joe Jones and Sarah Teitman in Cambridge, and then near Yusuf's lab at Berkeley is heading up data processing. The tissues from this project come from two different collections, uh, Live on New York uh, at, in New York and the Cambridge Biorepository for Translational Medicine, which is at Cambridge, and both uh, recruit uh, tissues from deceased organ donors. Just a few outlines of this project. So the aim of this project is to collect tissues from 24 donors, and currently our age range is between 18 and 75 years of age. There are two different tissue collection sites at Cambridge and New York, and we've met to harmonize our protocols as best as possible to remove any artifacts with uh, processing. We're aiming to collect up to eight tissues per donor, which will include a mixture of blood, bone marrow, spleen, lung, liver, skin, jejunum, three different lymph nodes, and bronchial alveolar lavage. Not all tissues are collected from each site due to ethics and um, collection logistics, which I'll come to in a moment. We're using 10x genomics 5' prime to uh, measure gene expression. We're also collecting TCR and BCR sequencing to assess repertoire differences between tissue and donor. Uh, we're using 130 uh, antibody psych seq panel to assess protein as well. And in a subset of donors, we're also performing a stimulation using PMA and iomycin for two hours. And as I mentioned before, NIR's lab is heading up the uh, data processing analysis at Berkeley. So all of our protocols are on protocols IO and explain the going from tissue, the dissociation to single cells, and the loading, hashtagging, site seeking, all the uh, protocol, all the practical steps needed to get to the single cell sequencing. And these are just uh, the, the screenshots from all of our protocol IO submissions. All of that protocol can be uh, reduced down to this flow chart. And this describes the different processing uh, methods we're using per tissue. And we've developed tissue optimal protocols to isolate immune cells, with the simplest being blood and bone marrow, which goes straight to glycol. Spleen and lymph nodes are physically chopped up into small pieces and mashed through filters. And the more solid organs also have a, uh, enzyme, a collagenase enzymatic digestion, with more specialist protocols being developed for the jejunum in the skin um, to, to enhance the uh, isolation of immune cells from each tissue. And then once we get to a single cell suspension, they're hashtag pulled and then um, uh, stimulated or not stimulated and then site seat to assess protein and then loaded on the 10X. The, one of the early discussions in this project is what stimulation to use to try and assess um, more heterogeneity in the immune system. And the flowchart I've just described of the tissue processing it takes about 15 hours from start to finish. 
And so we had two options with the stimulation. We either did a fairly short one, which could be tagged onto an already fairly long day, or a longer stimulation, so we had time to care for home, sleep, and come back and then press our samples the next day. So we did lots of optimization using either a short stimulation with PMA and anomycin or CD3 and CD28. And these are just some examples of the, uh, we did bulk nanostring as a quick way to um, assess transcriptional changes. And we opted for a two hour PMA stim that could be bolted onto the end of our tissue processing day. Reasons for it, I mean, whichever option we chose, nothing was, was perfect because what we wanted to do was to, uh, keep the cells fresh because from certain tissues, we only have isolated limited immune cells. And so freezing was an option for every tissue. And we wanted to try and assess um, what happens with stimulation in every tissue. So, so that's why we went for PMA so we could do everything fresh on the day. Um, this is a table for where we are in this project. Um, in the last week or so, we had three more donors, so I haven't had a chance to update this table. So this is as of um, early May when we had processed 19 of our donors. And the majority of our donors, we can collect spleen, lung, lung draining lymph node, jejunum, mesenteric lymph node, blood and bone marrow. And then uh, this is where we have site-specific tissues straight from Cambridge. Um, we're allowed to collect skin and liver. It doesn't go for transplantation. From New York, they collect um, bronchial avial lavage and inguinal lymph nodes that we can't collect in Cambridge. And then in a subset of donors, we're also performing the stimulation. And then for everything, we've got gene expression. And for the vast majority, we have PCR, BCR, and CERTC. So as this project is assessing age, um, it was really important to make sure we had a good distribution of age across um, a good representation of all ages from our donors. And when you combine the age distribution from our two sites, you can see we have almost three donors per decade of life. Um, and this is the breakdown between the two sites. And again, within site, we have a reasonably good distribution of age range. So that was important for this project. And both sites still have one donor left to collect. So I've never worked on a project this big before. And so it's quite... Um, interesting seeing how all this data was being processed. So, so far we've collected about 180 tissues, which is almost 300 10x reactions, um, well over a thousand libraries, and we're about at 1.2 million cells, with three donors still being sequenced due to collect. So we, I think we'll be in the ballpark of 1.5 million cells when we're finished. And so this is where NIA's team at Berkeley have come in and they've developed a computational infrastructure to handle this data set. So as the two collection centers, we upload the sequencing files to the AWS at Berkeley, and they run a whole series of analysis steps and outputs the data that we can look at um, at the other end. And these steps have all been automated by Elior and Ballet in NIRS group, and they involve the um, mapping of all the reads, the GC filtering, uh, demultiplexing using hash solo, free RNA removal using DeconX, um, doublet detection with solo, and then data integration using SCBI and total BI. And then finally, cell, cell, automated cell annotation using a tool called Cell Typist, which I'll talk about in a moment. So one of the really important things about annotating the data was because it's such a large data set, we wanted to try and generate, uh, make it as automated as possible. And so NIA's team implemented this pipeline that, that kind of tries to generate as many of the, as much information as we could possibly need at one time. And so the idea is that, that NIA's uh, lab generated the SCVI, which is the integration of gene expression and total VI, which is gene expression plus protein. And we're working at a tissue level at the moment. So all the samples from each tissue are merged into one data set. And then we're building models that contain just, contain either the unstimmed data alone or the unstimmed and stem cells integrated together um, it automatically runs LIDAR LID clustering at multiple resolutions, and we're using cell typist to annotate the data at three different resolutions, and the resolution is uh, determined by how many cell, predetermined cell labels there are on each model. And then we're doing manual inspection of the data. Um, this is version two of the data, and we're looking for issues to in working out what tweaks to the data processing pipeline need to be made, and um, there's a few uh, data quality issues with poor libraries being removed. And then we're checking manual annotation versus automated annotation, and also uh, identification of non-immune cells to be removed from the data. 
And that will inform v version three of the data, which we run in the next month or so. So cell typist um, is a tool developed by Sarah uh, Chuan and Thomas and Sarah Clackman's lab at Sanger. And this was published two weeks ago in Science. Um, it's one of the HCA papers. And it's an automated cell annotation tool. It's taken uh, 19 single cell tissue data sets, harmonized the annotations together to build a training set. And then you can upload your unannotated data set and it uses the um, reference data to annotate your data set. And in this paper we've published in Science, um, this is the cell type annotation of this immune data set. This is 330,000 uh, tissue immune cells and cell typist was used to an automatic, automated annotation of it. And it worked really well. So we're using this going forward with our annotation of the immune aging data set. Both of these resources are available online at celltypist.org is a huge documentation of this pipeline, as well as a really handy uh, cell encyclopedia with the markers that define each of these cell populations. And this 330,000 um, immune cell uh, data set is available at tissueimmunecellatlas.org as a cell by gene interactive viewer. So back to our uh, data set, I'll just show a few examples of the data. This is taking the mesenteric lymph node. So each tissue has its own embedding at the moment. And I'm just showing the projection of uh, data by site, donor, and whether it's stimulated or not. And you can, uh, if you look at the site, you can see you've got the blue from New York and the orange is the UK data. But what you'll also notice, you might think it's not integrated well, but on the plot on the right, you can see where the stimulation is around the peripheral um, of the UMAP space. And the stimulation was only done at Cambridge, so we have that as a um, explaining the, why it's not a clear integration here. Whereas if you look at the unstim cells, you can see there's great integration between all the donors. And here we've got 14 different donors being integrated together. So we've used cell typists to annotate this data set at two different resolutions. Uh, I'm showing examples of two different resolutions. A high resolution gives like an overview of the top level of the immune cell compartment. So it's only showing us T cells in um, pale green, B cells in blue, ILCs in the myeloid compartment up here. And then we have a second resolution, which is much more detailed and contains, I think, 90 different immune cell annotations. And you can see it's all broken down in, in, into quite a few different T cell uh, compartments, B cells and the myeloid. And so this is our starting point for annotating the data. It's a really good framework to build upon and it works, it works pretty well. And we, we're now using a selection of markers to check how well this annotate, automated annotation is annotating our data. So here's just a few examples of the classical markers in our data set. So this is just the RNA on the top row and the protein the site seek on the bottom, just, just showing um, the delineation of the T cells, the B cells, and the myeloid cells, and the NK cells, and how well that overlaps with this, this top level annotation from cell typist. And then the proteins on the bottom row, which pretty much mirrors the RNA perfectly, which is reassuring to see. So then one of the challenges with this data set is having a stimulated and a non stimulated data set. And so here I've split the uh, data into stimulated on the top and sorry, the non-stimulated on the top and the stimulated on the bottom. And one of the challenges is, is that the cell typist tool has been built on only non-stimulated data. And so now we've got the challenge of how do we annotate the stimulated data. If you look at the non-stimulated data, the labels make sense um, because they've all been learnt off lots of different non-stimulated cells. Whereas when the tool tries to annotate the stimulated data set, it's getting the compartment right but the actual label it's assigning is, is probably not correct or there isn't the correct label in the data set to assign to a stimulated cell. And so for example, um, within the B cells, a lot of the B cells are being labeled as age-associated B cells, whereas we know there should be a minority of the cells there and these are more like memory B cells, but the stimulation is changing the transcriptome of the cells and it's more similar now to an age-associated B cell than a memory B cell. And again, within the T cell, you can see most of the cells have been labeled as Th1, Th17 cells. Again, which is a, a very small proportion of the population in the unstimmed cells. And so 
we need to come up with a new set of labels to annotate the stimulated data. And so what was reassuring to see with the stimulated data is that when we did our bulk uh, optimization at the start, uh, the bunch of genes that are clearly upregulated um, with activation are perfectly um, reproduced in our connect single cell data. And you can see things like IL2 um, beautifully upregulated within two hours and some early activation markers. And so this is where we're working on now as to what labels to assign these cells for the, for the annotation. But reassuring to see that this data mirrors what we were hoping to see. And hopefully this will um, uncover more heterogeneity within, you, in, within the immune system. So this is the current state of play with the data. Um, we've got two more donors to collect, complete this collection. And then we're working on um, version three of our analysis. So this is going to include quite a few updates to QC and some of the code behind the, behind the scenes, and also include three more donors that have been sequenced. And so the current discussions within our consortium is, is how do we annotate the data and what resolution are we happy to annotate to? Do we want to go, you know, are we happy to go to central memory T cells or do we want to subset them further? And so these are discussions we're currently having in, in how best to do that. Um, and then also, how do we annotate a stimulated data set? Do we do it based on the unstim labels or do we develop a new set of labels that describe the stimulated data based on what, let's say, cytokines or, or the top gene expression markers they are? And so, I just come back to the start of this project. The aim is to create a tissue immune atlas, which we're well on our way to doing. And then the next part of the analysis, which we haven't started doing yet, is to look at what changes are we seeing within by age, um, both at the cell type level and also at the transcriptome level. So if the cell population doesn't change, but within a cell population, do we see any differences in gene expression? So with that, I'd like to conclude and just, just finish by saying a huge thank you to the families of all the donors who have uh, donated uh, tissues for the study without which none of this would be possible and also our funders and i'm just a small part of this project there are five other groups who have you know contributed hugely to this project and it's my privilege to present this data so thank you very much thank you daniel this is such an impressive effort and thank you for sharing highlights with us uh, i have a, a few questions um some technical some more broad um, what an impressive collections of sample. And uh, mm -hmm. as you said, like this is um, thanks to the generosity of these families. Ha I, do you have a sense of the postmortal interval for the collection of these uh, tissues across donors? Is it quite varied? Uh, does it track mm. with age? No. So I, I, I'll speak from the Cambridge side where I, I have the closest to the, um, it's, it's within hours. Oh, wow. We receive the tissues. So um, we get a call um, any time, day or night, to say that there's a, a donor whose organs are going to go for transplant. And then the surgeons will come in, take the organs that are going for the actual transplant. And then um, people from the CBTM will then go in to receive, re, re, um, collect uh, tissues for research. And there's, a, there's quite a few sites, groups around Cambridge who receive these. So it could be... I'd probably say four hours. That's impressive. Um, something like that. From from yeah. So so I guess you and indirect, uh, indirectly answer my next question. So these are all donors that would be eligible for uh, organ transplants. Yeah. So yes. that kind of helps assess a form of how healthy a donor would be. Yeah. So so they have to be healthy enough that their organs can go for transplant. That's the only criteria um, for inclusion yeah. at the moment. It's very, very impressive coordination to be able to do this um, so quickly. Um, I have another question. Uh, I think it's very clever to think about um, ex uh, vivo stimulation to try to uh, capture cell, activated cell substances, given that these donors are um, more on a normal health spectrum. Do you have plans to try to assess how the... Um, uh, transcriptional profiles are capturing through your PMA simulation are actually reflective of in vivo human cell states? Like you're trying to capture probably some cell states that we see more in also disease. And so is the idea in the future to compare with different disease states to figure out which one or more like 
representative of in vivo versus just in, in vitro? I think that's that's a really good question. And, and yes, I mean, that's part of the reason for doing the stimulation to try and assess what what the potential of these immune cells are to produce, you know, responses. And so it helps to, when you're comparing to disease status set, saying, yep, yeah, these cells can be pushed to into this inflammatory uh, situation. So yeah, we don't have any um, disease data sets as such to compare with directly, but I think it's a great um, avenue to explore going forward. Yeah, I mean, I think it's helpful, right? That a lot of different groups are developing different in vitro assays, and we often try to do our follow-up studies um, using human primary cells, but sometimes it remains challenging to figure out how they relate to in vivo mm -hmm. settings. So you're going to start having a, a really nice data set to start um, answering these questions. So this this is great. Perhaps one, one last question is more broad to um, let you speak about this beautiful data set, which is includes many organ system acro mm -hmm. uh, across different individuals, but also within the same individual. And I noted that you have both lymph nodes as well as the adjacent tissue. Yeah. So beyond identifying um, uh, different cell subsets, which would be a very important contribution to the atlas, what are your plans to try to relate? Do you have any, I imagine you have plans to relate the cells across organ systems. Yeah, so that, that's one of the reasons we collected things like the lung draining lymph node and the lung, the mesenteric lymph node and the gut to try and assess um, how well does the immune cells within the lymph node reflect what's going on in the gut? And, and because it's a lot easier to extract the immune cells from the lymph node. So just from practical reasons, um, are they representative of the actual organ they survey? Um, and also then we're also going to look at the TCR, BCR sharing between the lymph node and the organ as well to assess um, how the repertoire differences uh, or shared between them. And then you can then compare, okay, is a lung lymph node and a gut lymph node um, have a different TCR, BCR environment to, to, to the, uh, the opposite. So yeah, so we do certainly have plans to assess that. And, and I imagine try to assess trafficking to the extent that you can, depending on the number of cells and donors. Well, um, I want to congratulate you again uh, for this beautiful work. Uh, we look forward to seeing the results. This is a huge undertaking and the, mm -hmm. um, it is impressive how you're coordinating across different sites. I also think it's extremely commendable that you have all coordinated your protocols and submitted on protocol IO. I think all of us should be doing that. So thank you for setting the example. We thought it would be great to have a discussion around lesson learned so far from trying to put together a human immune cell atlas since this is part of the scope of the next year and a half. Right, we're gonna to try to come together, integrate each of our data sets to accomplish that. Nir, do I still have crackling? If so, we can take the lead with the questions. There's a little bit, I mean, it's not, it's not uh, but yeah, I can, I can definitely pose the questions, but you should, you, you can talk, it's no, no problem. Um, so yeah, so we had uh, several questions we wanted to bring up. And um, in particular, uh, the first question is, in the process of generating and analyzing data for your immune uh, atlas or organ, um, what are the useful lessons you've learned that could benefit other atlasing efforts, whether experimental or analytical or sampling uh, that have, uh, um, yeah, so if we can come up with, with a few um, a few lessons that you've learned from your experiences, that would be great to kind of bring those up to the top level. Is so, go ahead, Ramon. Ramon yeah. Go ahead. yeah. I sh should I start or run yeah, you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. For me, one one key lesson is that is really key to to track your confounding factors and to have a, a complete understanding of every other source of variability that might explain your data besides your cell types that you're trying to, to find, right? And this can be everything, doublets, poor quality cells, etc. So in our case, uh, well, this is something that we've commented in, in previous meetings but to have different methods, for example, to call a doublet. We had experimental annotation that this came from the cell hashing. This gave us a, an experimental annotation on which cells were doublets. 
but also running Scrablet, Doublet Finder, et cetera, and then coming up with a, a consensus on on what cells might be doublets. Because for ex there are so many cell types that could be explained by both sources of variability. For example, we had one that are CD8 T follicular cells. So this, of course, our worry is, are these cells real cell types or are a CD8 merged with a, a CD40 follicular? So being able to disentangle all of that is, is really key. Also to initially be very permissive with the thresholds because, for example, one thing that people filter out are, are genes that are not expressed in, in a certain number of cells. And as you've seen, I found, well, we found 13 precursor T cells that had this signature of CD1 genes. So imagine that I had put the threshold at 20 genes. If, if a certain gene is not expressed in at least 20 cells, I mean, 20 cells, then this gene is filtered out. This means that all the signature that is characterizing this super rare cell type now is not there anymore. So, and this goes for genes, goes for cells as well. And yeah, and then just applying a, a recursive filtering step in which now you focus on CD4 T cells. So now you have more capability for disentangling which clusters might be doublets for quality cells. You see the markers, you see if they express markers of two mutually exclusive lineages, then you exclude them. So being very, very cautious with, with these things. Thank you, Ramon. That's a great thought. I think um, Dana's being very resourceful here in, in typing her thoughts. And uh, since we cannot hear her, so she said one lesson is that certain cell type of immune cells need to be enriched from tissues doing a simple CD45 positive cell isolation doesn't capture many of the myeloid um, cell lineage. And I, I couldn't agree more. Um, we've experienced the same thing. We started enriching for all main lineage ourselves as well to also even the sampling. Otherwise, another thing is that you keep on always measuring the most abundant cell types, which precludes you from making discoveries. So then I completely agree with you. Um, so it's, it's, it's about enrichment and sampling strategy, I think. Um, we'll go to John and then and Ron. Joe, sorry. Yeah, yeah I, th I think, yeah, so the the project that we've been involved in with, um, in collaboration with Donna was trying to get immune cells from across the human body. So one of the big challenges for our group has been how you cope with processing so many different tissues all arriving at the same time. Um, that's been a real challenge, I guess, in terms of what we've done is to just try and be very um, streamlined with how we process the tissue, have, um, you know, really think about what we're doing with our protocols, trying to maintain the kind of quality of the, the cells that we're getting, but being realistic about what we can do in the time um, that, that we've got to process the tissues. And I guess the other thing, I, don't, I know Donna can't um, join in in terms of, of speaking through audio, but I guess the other thing was when you collaborate with a group, you're trying very much to match the way you're processing the tissues. And and that's that. I think we've done that well by having lots of meetings. Um, we went over to Donna's lab, for example, to learn how they process some of their tissues to try and standardize and, and optimize a lot of the, the protocols. Ron? Yeah, so there's a whole field of um, how we need to advance the imaging work to get to the right quality and um, reproducibility and we've done a lot of controls now where we've stained with ostensibly the same batch of antibodies and run the, the, the slides on the same instrument and the sections are from the same lymph node but the intensities of the staining are different and uh, without tracking everything back what I can tell you is we're moving to an automated uh, staining system that comes out of path labs in order to minimize manual labor we're also uh, making sure we avoid batch effects by putting uh, experimental, if you will, and control samples on the same slide so that they're uh, in exactly the same antibody solution imaged on exactly the same instrument with the same settings. And then adding an extra sample of a control tissue that we know should bind all the antibodies we're using and putting that on every slide. So then we can cross normalize to those intensities for every one of the antibodies to all of the sections we do for a given experiment. That's not anything I showed you today, but we've learned that uh, if you don't do that, 
you're going to call all sorts of new clusters of cells every time you, you do the staining analysis. Uh, and that's not a very good a good thing going forward if you're trying to, to do this. So there's a whole upgrade that, that the whole imaging field really needs. You don't see this in any of the published papers, except maybe the Astropath paper from the Hopkins group. But everything else is done in a way where these are clear uh, problems going forward. So that has to, to happen for the imaging to really get to that higher quality level. But I still do think that imaging ought to be a quality control for the single cell. Mm -hmm. you ought to, as soon as you find a new cell, do the best you can, especially if you're beginning to roll out um, selective fish rather than spatial, spatial transcriptomics to combine available antibodies and the RNA to ask, can you find the cell you're characterizing um, in, your, in your clusters, in your UMAPs? And where are they? I think that would be a really good way forward to come up with an atlas. I couldn't agree more on orthogonal validation um, and, and spatial context. It's so important to making sure that a predicted new cell type is actually real. Um, and and we've heard, of course, from you and now from um, Joe and, and, and Donna was uh, nodding that really um, clean center operating procedure with proper controls have been are, are essential in making sure we produced um, reproducible uh, reference data sets. And so it's impressive that, um, Joe and Donna, you've been going back and forth across the, the pound to make this happen. This is, this is, this is great. Um, any, any other thoughts we heard about also sampling strategies, um, different artifacts from Ramon, who you know, reminds us that we need to be careful um, I'd, be, I'd be curious to hear about um, orthogonal validation. Um, Aaron, you mentioned imaging. Are others trying to also prospectively isolate predicted cells and prospectively profile them or leveraging? I guess we heard from Ramon using multimodal data to try to better characterize them. Oh, oh Dan, can you say hello? See if we hear you. Oh, complete failure of this platform. I apologize, everyone. Um, stay on, keep on talking, and maybe at some point we'll hear you. Um, uh, Thomas, anything else you wanted to add before we move to the next question? I, th I thought they were excellent points. I agree with all of them. Um, I think sampling based on like people is important as well, um, both from kind of a diversity point of view, but even just across things like age. And so, uh, you know, the immune system looks very different across age, and normal for an adult is different to normal for you know, in pediatrics or other contexts. So just sampling at that kind of level, I think is uh, really important, but has some, you know, challenges. The data sets then, then get larger, more diverse, and that has additional challenges. I'm glad you bring this up because I was hoping that um, Jay, who, who we couldn't hear either in left or was going to touch on this since he represents um, ADA, the Asian Diversity Atlas. So both in terms of Age, of course, especially for the immune cells, I'm sure we're going to uncover a vast array of heterogeneity as we start integrating different extreme of our, our lifespan, but also also ethnicity um, is quite key, um, which can bring up the question, you know, what is a fair representative atlas? But we'll, we'll get, get to that question. And um, we'll ask another question, but Bill, feel free to come back to this first question if you have other thoughts. So in your opinion, what is the purpose of version 1.0? So just to put things in greater context, right? I mentioned in the very beginning, we're in the coming months, we are trying to identify the key initial uh, immune-related data sets that will be integrated um, to create the version 1.0 of the HD immune cell atlas. So in your opinion, what is the purpose of, what should be the purpose of our version 1.0 of this HD immune cell atlas? And to fulfill this purpose, what should the atlas capture in terms of information, you know, measurement, resolution, um, and in that spirit, you know, how do you think we can achieve such fair and representative immune cell atlas? So there any thoughts about what should go into version 1.0? One second, if I can answer also the, the first question. That yeah, I had please, another please. Thought. Yeah, one thing that now that we start uh, merging data sets together, I think that is really important to keep track of the of the fact that we must be able to keep biological heterogeneity once we start correcting for batch effects. 
And this data set that I showed in my introduction for Hemiskin, that's something that we integrated initially in our atlas and was a, an internal positive control that the heterogeneity and the cell types that they found, once the, they were integrated in our data set, they were still preserved and they were not merged or, or mixed. So in that sense, uh, having good metadata that we can ensure that is kept there, that what we define as a cell type in the meta atlas is still uh, a cell type, or at least we are even stratifying it further. And I think that's, that's really important. That's an excellent point, Ramon. Yeah. So uh, any thoughts on, you know, wh what should go in, in version point? Oh, yes, Ron. Well, I guess my question is, is version 1.0 going to be a list or an atlas? Well, that's a good question. What, it's a, it's what our in decision your opinion as a group, an atlas? what we want to define, yeah. I, I think a lot of it also has to do, there's going to be obviously several versions, and a lot of it has to do with the data that is currently available as technologies are progressing and advancing. Uh, I foresee a lot more spatial data. I don't know how much we will have in the first version. But we'd love to hear your thoughts about it, keeping in mind that we have to go with what's available right now. Well, I, you know, I, I think there's a, a, one of the questions that comes up all the time is whether efforts like this should be via cores or individual groups. And obviously, the technology has become robust enough if it's done carefully in the way, you know, Joe and Ramon and, and Don have been talking about it to do the single cell work, even though you're still gonna have a jamboree to figure out if you really can do the, 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 you know, the uh, assignments and, uh, and ontologies. But um, there is an issue with the imaging being in dispersed places on different platforms. That there, the technology is such that you could wind up with a lot of different calls. As I say, we've redone some of the published data sets using the, the approaches I talked about today. And a lot of what's there remains, but we get somewhat different answers. And we also see where a lot of the flaws are. So for example, the registration that I told you about, the absence of correction for batch effects. And so it raises the question of whether one or a very small number of cores dedicated to the high level uh, imaging can come up with a standard among them, that then they could accept tissue from all the places that's been uh, that have done the analysis of single cells, and provide at least a, a 1.0 map. It won't be as fine grained as we would like. It's not going to be 100 plus parameters. Uh, it's going to probably be in the 30 to 50 parameter range, but really sort of a first map of where the finer grained analyses of the cells would would be. And I think that's doable and time available if one could generate the resources to decide that there are such places to do it. Um, that's one option. The other is just to say that's 1.5 or 2.0 and just get all the single cell stuff right. Um, I don't think the, the spatial transcriptomic approaches are going to be available fast enough and um, qualified enough for to get what you'd want out of those in the time that's available. I could be wrong, but just looking at where things stand right now, I, I'm not sure I see that at the at single cell resolution. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think I think this is gonna go for um, version 2.0, um, hopefully the following year as we integrate more of this information. Um, I completely agree. I, I'm going to read uh, Donna's thoughts. Um, she wrote for version 1.0, suggests that we should restrict the data, um, the age range, because age is a major factor for variability of immune cells. Um, uh, that we should limit version 1.0 to adults of age that we have the most representation and not include elderly or very young. Um, and she gives an example, a 20-year-old is quite different than a 50-year-old. Um, uh, yes, I agree, and, and I think a lot of the uh, er early efforts around the world that were funded are indeed those that focus on adults, and so I very much 
believe that's uh, I agree with you that's going to be the case and I'm sorry I didn't read your earlier point that when with lesson learned which is different tissues require specific protocols for optimizing immune yields and yes one size fits all solutions rarely works again completely agree um, it's easy to generate data it's not easy to generate good quality data and good representative quality data it's worth the time um, yeah, I want to respond respond quickly to um, Ron's point about the centralized processing um, in many of the consortia that I've been involved in, that's exactly the way we've done it. Um, you know, different sites may have tissues or sources of tissues, but it'd be it's ideal when one site does the processing. So then the batch effect is it's amazingly how how much reduced it is when we do that. As you said, there's still batch effects even within a site, but it's it's dramatically reduced for for any any types of uh, methods that you're talking about. So I agree that's something that we should think about as a community if there's some tissues we want to do that for. But given given that, that that's already being done in some consortia, and some of these consortia are going to in fact be the sources of the data for an atlas that kind of comes together, maybe we can do maybe we'll have some of that on, uh, for for specific tissues, which will be nice. Um, the other question I had for people is what what tissues should be included for version 1.0? Uh, oh, wait, we want to see if Dan can speak. Dan, can you, you heard? No, still not. I don't understand. Okay, so what tissue should be included in version 1.0? Um, what are people's thoughts on on that? And Donna, you can type them in if you if you have a thought on which tissue should be included. Obviously, the, you know, the key lymphoid organs uh, is what what we're imagining would be the ones plus bone marrow and blood. But any other thoughts um, on That's this right. point? Obviously, the immune system is everywhere. <laughs> One thing I'm, I'm not sure I agree with is with restricting to a specific age group, because then we might be already biasing the, the next versions towards the first one that we choose. And also the, the usefulness of starting to merge data from from different places is that we are, we start to block certain confounding factors. For example, a, a huge confounder that we have is that, as I've showed you, we have old adults and, and kids, right? And, and young adults. So of course, in, in kids, we see that they have way more follicles. So as they have more follicles, we see more germinal center B cells, T follicular helper cells, whereas the, the old have more uh, memory B cells, memory T cells. So that's one explanation. We see that because of age. But another explanation could be because the kids uh, had hyperplastic uh, tonsils, that they underwent tonsillectomies because they have this inflammatory process going on, whereas the, the adults didn't have that. They had sleep apneas. So how can we disentangle one from the other? But if we start merging data from different places, and then we found now kids that of course, that, that's just an example, but we, the more data that we have, the easier that we can start blocking confounders and, and getting to narrowing down the explanation on, on what we see. I mean, uh, Ramon, um, of course, I, I, I support what, what you're saying. And I think the real, I mean, if we're going to go with what's available in terms of the data, in your case, you have a beautiful cohort that spans age range, which will allow to capture that information. I think some of the challenges that the other efforts, including pediatric atlas, were just recently funded, and so less likely to have data on time for version 1.0. Um, but you know, we'll try to capture as many data set as, as possible. And, and that brings me to a reminder to all of you who are listening, we send another email. Please let us know if you'd like us to um, integrate your data set. You can um, email us at um, immunesatatlas.com. Um, we sent an email again, reminder, this morning. Um, I'm curious um, about the lung and the colon that were mentioned um, uh, specifically. Why, the, um, of course, you know, they're a great organ system, but why specifically lung and colon? Um, and any thoughts? I mean, I, you know, I mean, actually, we, yeah, go ahead. Tom. I, mean, I, I was just going to say. Go ahead. 
I was just going to say that with our project where we're taking um, tissues from across the body, we're obviously seeing very interesting signatures in the different tissues. And I think it would be lovely to capture that information in um, Atlas, whether it be Atlas version one or 1.5. I guess it's whether you, whether there's a sort of cutoff, cutoff in terms of cell numbers that you needed to have um, have in your data set to be very secure about the data, whether that's what you're planning with Atlas version one, whether you want a certain number of tissues or a certain number of cells from certain tissues for it to be able to be included. But I think that we're seeing such interesting compartment differences that ultimately it would be great to get that data across across the human body. Absolutely. And, and, and Donna added small intestines and large in, intestines have many immune cells. Yes, I mean, all, all organ systems are interesting. I was just um, was curious to know why you mentioned these particular ones. I think, it, and as you all know, the, there's different organ system um, bio networks. So uh, one other thing we're going to seek um, from doing is ask all of the other bio network ones that are done integrating data set if they can also share with us the immune cells it capture so we can integrate this. But to Donna's earlier point, unless you've really enriched for certain immune cell lineage, um, the, the sampling may not be optimal in other tissues or so. Point is, the point is well taken. Um, Tom, I think, Thomas, I think you were trying to jump in initially with some thoughts, please. Yeah, I am. Um, I definitely agree with the lung and the uh, intestine, but the, the lung I sort of like early in COVID, I remember thinking like what resource would have been cool to have. And like a lung atlas, for instance, gives you, you know, the respiratory tract kind of in, uh, let's call it a steady state, but, you know, a respiratory tract that is kind of undergoing inflammation or, you know, um, sort of uh, dealing with an infectious disease is going to look very different. But it'll also look very different to blood in the same situation. Many of the myeloid cells don't exist until, you know, a specific situation arises. And I, I, you know, I, I've I've seen you know a number of people utilize things like the lung atlases, and you know some some people I know who kind of get that information, but it doesn't quite give enough insight into what's happening in an inflammatory process. And I just I remember thinking, you know, what should be in version one? What what would I have loved to have had, you know, a couple of years ago? And that's kind of the thing that I picture. Like, how helpful would that have been at the time? But it is tricky because I mean, you know, there has to be a line. At some point, we have to say, okay, well, that's that's enough version one otherwise will but, but thomas you bring you bring up a great point though you know the inflammatory condition it's something chloe and i have talked about a lot which is was an atlas resting or do we want the an atlas to, to have some inflammatory condition so it'd be great to hear people's views on that dan you seem you seem to agree so we can put it in the chat if we can't hear you some of your thoughts on that Well, yeah, I, I certainly... and obviously there's an endless number of inflammatory conditions, so that's you know the, the point. But but the immune system is 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 just not as interesting as you know until you until you activate it. So what would be the the best activation conditions that would be should be included in a first atlas? And you know, COVID, yes, COVID, and flu, et cetera, and lung is is very feasible to include in a first atlas. We could bring those groups that have the best data there together. And, and pull that together into the first house, and it would be fantastic. I guess there's also like an accessibility issue, like maybe not lung tissue necessarily, but at least the airway can be sampled in, you know, um, a lot of clinical contexts where you're not actually having to, you know, isolate tissue itself. Um, so, you know, patients who are like intubated, for example, or, or producing sputum and things, you can get, it's not exactly lung, but it is respiratory, which can be uh, insightful in that context, it's maybe a, a middle ground of some kind. And I guess it just goes back to the point that I think Ramon made about making sure that you've got very good metadata, because as soon as you start to go into disease states, which are obviously really interesting and seeing the immune system kind of in activation, but you've got the confounders of the disease, the treatments, et cetera. So um, I guess it's even more important about ca capturing that data accurately. Yeah, absolutely. I think that at least the way I see these different disease state is as a window into capturing all existing potential immune cell subsets. So it's not that we're trying to, you know, map specifically biology to COVID-19, although we, I mean, some efforts specifically focus on this, but it's to use um, a perturbation, in this case, an infection to try to see what new immune cell states emerged. And so unless you perturb the immune system, um, you will be missing a lot of pieces of the puzzle. 
at least to the, the full list run that we're trying to establish. Now, where the South State is in the tissue, we may not have all the data initially. To be very pragmatic, to allow teams to start integrating, we need to um, identify data sets that, that will be available by this fall. And so there's also a lot of published data sets that, that, that we can integrate in that regard. And yes, metadata is is definitely very key, especially for correcting for batch effects. Um, Aron, I want to make sure we read your message, which is um, back to the intestines, has the largest number of immune cells, and clearly has a special subset of importance. The lung is obviously relevant given the ongoing pandemic. Um, and so, yes, I, I I don't know how many disease states will include for the initial um, atlas, but we welcome thoughts beyond just today. And Donna added, in humans, there are ongoing perturbations, partly in the lung and at the science, even in the absence of disease, yes. And, and that brings the question, you know, how much sampling do we need to do before we are happy <laughs> with an initial draft? Um, and maybe, I don't know if you, any, you have any thoughts, but um, maybe time will tell. Um, uh, I guess I guess I can ask the question: What are, in your opinion, the most pressing issues that you think the our HE immune bio network community should solve collectively in order to successfully put forward version 1.0 of our atlas? So we heard metadata, perhaps harmonizing our metadata. Um, Ramon, yes. Uh, so here uh, we could learn from the the cancer genome atlas, the the TCG8, because the what they use is that the barcode that they use to identify each sample already tells you the the most important metadata that that you need to work with that sample and what will happen to us is that as soon as we have count matrices with millions of cells it will be very hard to keep data frames excel sheets whatever that keep track of all the metadata so what we could do is to put a, a prefix in, in front of its cell barcode that captures the most important metadata and that we can parse computationally and then take these confounders into account to try to explain that data once we're trying to cluster it and annotate it. And then the, the discussion would be what are these, these confounders and, and how do we mm, harmonize and, and, yeah, and set these identifiers. But that would be really handy. Yeah, so the metadata problem, yes. Um, that, that's a good point, Ramon. And the data science platform from the HGA has some um, metadata matrix when people submit their data. And so perhaps what we can really reinforce that those data sets that are selected for the first Atlas draft have the most complete metadata information. Um, anything else? Any other issues you all think we should be solving? I, I'm a big proponent of. Um, Annotation. That's why there's going to be a jamboree. I'm very curious, and 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 Ron, I know with the premise that this is more like ranking list than spatial relevance. But like as a first problem, if you give everybody, I always use this as an example. If we give everybody the same integrated data set of three million T cells, and you ask everyone to um, annotate, and by annotate to me it includes, of course, QC clustering, subclustering. I'm curious to know how many subsets every group identifies and how they label them. I'm willing to place a bet that some groups will identify 60 subsets and others only like perhaps 10. And I think we need to have a conversation about how we approach um, annotation using different multimodal data and how we label um, and take into account legacy knowledge. I run. Yeah, so in that context, I think I mentioned this last time, given that NIH is supporting PubMap, and they're doing a whole deep dive on ontologies and how you define uh, subsets. And one of my colleagues here is involved in doing the, 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 the lymphoid components of that. I think some effort needs to be made to figure out what they're saying versus what you're saying. Because if you have two major sort of One's not global in the same way as HCA is, but, but very big efforts on overlapping issues, and you come up with different ontologies or different annotations, it's just going to make a mess of things for everybody. So there's got to be some way you communicate with the HubMap people and they talk to you uh, as you're going forward. You can agree to disagree. You know, I'm not saying everything will all come out all, all nice in that, but I think not having that discussion before you release something is just going to cause a problem. 
So I really encourage you to do that. Yes, no, thank you for flagging this. And we'll be inviting them to our effort to be to make sure we're all part of the same discussion and we don't reinvent the wheel. Um, we'll also be announcing um, during the June 27th year old meeting the uh, HC SAL annotation platform, uh, which is meant to be neutral and will be bridging with the group uh, from HubMap. And this is going to be an online platform that will enable communities to come and compare how they label the cells. So to be clear, it's not about clustering or subclustering, it's really at the, lab, at the level of ontology, and we'll be bridging with the HubMap group for ontology so that you know, um, we, we make sure we don't add confusion <laughs> to, to, um, to the field. Um, um, but point well taken. So yeah, for me, one of the biggest challenges as we each work, because of course every group are independently working on their own atlas and they should and push for their own specific effort. But the next stage is to come all together to bring a, a first draft. And to me, one of the big challenges related to how we approach annotation um, as, as it's gonna be pretty challenging if we all have very different take on it. And so uh, for those of you who are interested by the question, um, please stay tuned. We'll, we'll be sending some emails in the coming week uh, about this to try to kind of come all together around this question. Um, any, any other thoughts about um, uh, any pressing issues? We should all be, um, we're almost at the end, but uh, final, I should say final thoughts about lesson learned, things we should think about for the Atlas. Maybe we'll, we'll let everyone say a final thoughts before we... Um, we conclude. Um, Nir, maybe I start with you. Any final thoughts? No, I think the the main thing is we want to have I think working a working group that is excited to pull it together to to meet and kind of hammer these these issues until we get you know a very clear uh, map or plan um, for what the first version should be and how it should be. You know, what kind of portal we would want and how we want it to to work, which you know is something that can happen across all of HCA. But for the immune specific atlas, we'll we'll want to have those meetings to make to make those decisions. So I would definitely encourage people uh, on the panel, but also across who are listening, to to okay. join us and. and um, Joe, any short final thoughts you want to share? Um, I mean, I think beyond version one, I think the importance of making sure that the atlas is representative in terms of, so we've discussed age, but also ethnic diversity. Um, and I think, and that is a challenge. It's definitely a challenge working in Cambridge and getting deceased donor tissue um, because the program tends to be dominated by um, Caucasian donors. Um, so that's, a, that's definitely a challenge in the longer term to make sure it's a truly representative human cell atlas, but perhaps beyond version one. <laughs> Yeah, thank and you. I agree, I agree. Annotation is definitely the big issue, I'd say, and how that how you go about doing that. Thank you, uh, Thomas. Um, any final thoughts? Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I certainly agree. Annotation is tricky, and I actually I think having some methods to disagree is also really good, um, especially in the sort of myeloid world. Like we see things very differently for very good reasons. I, I kind of like that. I like that we. Like, because it's it's challenging. It's like, well, am I am I really thinking about the cell the way I should be? Um, and having a, an avenue for that, uh, I think, is really important as well. Keeping it um, flexible. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah, and even just some other aspects that relate to it. Like, I mean, something that we will be missing, for example, will be granular sites because we just will. Um, which is, you know, for me, is always like, oh man, like it's it is difficult. It's not trivial to sort of do sort of the granular site lineages this way. But, you know, I think that's going to be important, maybe not in version one, but that, you know, in, at some point that has to become part of kind of the bigger picture. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Thomas. Um, uh, um, I will do a, a Ramon and then um, Ron. Yeah, I totally agree with how hard the annotation is. And for me, the, the annotation effort should be something flexible, as you said, that could be updated and discussed over time. So the way that we've done it for the, the Tonsil Atlas is as you've seen in these HCA tonsil packets, there is a column in the metadata that is annotation and, and the date that we annotate itself. And that was our best uh, effort that we could do on that date. But as new evidence uh, starts to accumulate that discusses that annotation, as new eyes start looking at, at our data, then we want to have a platform so that people can discuss 
and propose changes. And this, I think, it's very important because at the end of the day, it's, it's a bit subjective. We will have ontologies, but there will be new findings that that uh, challenge those ontologies. So it needs to be flexible. Yes. I think that's a, that's a great point about timestamp. Um, thank you, Ramon. And, and finally, Ron, any last thoughts? I was going to say we're at time and I should go, but I'll just point out that you can have a column that says consensus, whatever that means, majority, however, and then links to that on the slide saying alternative views. So everybody can say that they have another name or another way of considering it, links to the, to the published or online data sets that supports that other interpretation. So the community has sort of a, a sense of what it thinks, but you have all the other objections. People can look at that you don't want to get trapped with a name because you put a name on something and people then think in a certain way that can be lost in t-cell and they don't they don't really think about what's going on biologically so I, I think having you know some consensus so people can try to share the same terminology like in the, in the protein database but having this alternative list with constantly updated is, is a good way to go Thank you all again for joining and please reach out, uh, stay tuned for some emails from near Hakon and myself and do reach out meanwhile if you have any questions. Thank you all. Thank you Bye. all. Thanks. Thank you everyone.